Hello everyone. Welcome back to our channel, Canada Immigration. We hope you're doing great. Significant legislative and case law changes in labor and employment law occurred in Canada in 2022, some of which were connected to COVID-19. Well, in this episode, we'll discuss 25 key developments in Canadian labor and employment law in 2022. So, to get all the information, pay attention, and watch the video through to the end please hit, like, and, subscribe, and don't forget to push the notification bell for upcoming episodes. So, without any further delay, let's jump into the video. First, to stop the spread of COVID-19, Ontario and British Columbia produced arbitration awards that supported the implementation of vaccination policies in the workplace. We saw a constant stream of arbitration decisions in British Columbia and Ontario in 2022 that addressed concerns about unionized workplace COVID-19 immunization requirements. As long as employers met with their commitment to providing reasonable accommodations for workers under applicable human rights laws, the weight of authority supported the implementation of vaccination programs in the workplace to stop the spread of COVID-19. The arbitrators concluded that the minimal interference with employee privacy rights was outweighed by management's right to implement reasonable rules and regulations under the collective agreement, and the employer's obligation to take necessary steps to protect the health and safety of workers under occupational health and safety legislation. Arbitrators remarked that because a pandemic's reasonableness of a vaccination program is contextual and highly dynamic, context is a crucial issue to take into consideration. The belief was also relatively consistent that a required vaccination policy that included the potential of punishment or termination upon an employee's failure to comply with a mandatory vaccination policy was acceptable given that the alternative was offered in a way that was compliant with the rules of the collective agreement. Employees were informed that termination of employment was a possibility, and the employer inquired about individual circumstances and, when practicable. Second, the Employment Standards Act, 2000's new prohibition on non-competition agreements, according to Ontario Superior Court of Justice, does not apply to agreements entered until before October 25, 2021. On December 2, 2021, Ontario's Bill 27 The Working for Workers Act, 2021 became law. The Act, among other things, modified the Employment Standards Act of 2000 to make it illegal for employers to enter into a non-compete agreement with a worker or application for employment, as part of an employment contract or other arrangement. This restriction is exempt if a firm is sold or if the employee is an executive. The Act states that the ban on non-compete provisions is to be regarded in effect as of October 25, 2021, although it is unclear if this ban extends to non-compete arrangements that were signed before that date. In Parek et al v Schechter et al, 2022 ONSC 302, the Superior Court of Justice of Ontario provided an answer to this query by ruling that non-compete agreements signed before the restrictions effective date of October 25, 2021, are exempt from the prohibition. On a rare occasion, and only if the employer can prove that the non-competition limitation is fair in all material aspects, such non-compete agreements may be upheld in conformity with the common law. Moving on to the third, whether exceptional circumstances warrant giving more than 24 months' worth of high-end, reasonable notice exceeds the state of the law, according to the Ontario Court of Appeal. The Ontario Court of Appeal dismissed the employer's appeal of a lower court decision in Curry v. Nileen Canada Inc., 2022 ONCA 209, in which the trial judge found exceptional circumstances to support awarding 26-month salary instead of notice, which was greater than the 24-month high-end amount of reasonable notice for long-term employees despite its own 2019 judgment in Door v. The OCA reached this conclusion. The Equitable Life Insurance Employer of Canada, 2019 ONCA 512, where lowered a 30-month reasonable notice award to 24 months under the judicial precedent that stated that despite criteria including seniority, long-term or career long years of service of a committed and loyal employee at the same company, old age at the time of termination, and difficulties obtaining new work merited a considerable notice period, such elements are already recognized and rewritable, the law has become ambiguous in light of these conflicting rulings. Fourth, 
Certain employers are required to have a written policy regarding the electronic monitoring of employees, under an amendment to Ontario's Employment Standards Act from 2000. The Working for Workers Act, 2022, Bill 88 of Ontario obtained royal assent and was signed into law on April 11, 2022. Bill 88 amended the Employment Standards Act, 2000 of the province, among other things, to mandate that certain employers have a written policy regarding electronic monitoring of employees, policy in place for all employees by October 11, 2022, and to provide a copy to current employees by November 10, 2022. Ontario released employer instructions for adhering to the policy on July 13, 2022, in your guide to the Employment Standards Act. Coming on the next, a Nalex own kit must be provided and maintained in good condition by certain employers, per Ontario's Occupational Health and Safety Act amendment, in force on June 1, 2023. Also modified by Bill 88, the Working for Workers Act of 2022, was the Occupational Health and Safety Act of Ontario one of the OSHA modifications mandates that specific companies furnish, and keep in good working order Nalex own kits in workplaces where they know or should know that there may be a danger of an opioid overdose occurring among employees. Ontario declared the OSHA changes made by Bill 88 in effect on December 8, 2022, and said that the Nalex own kit requirement will take effect on June 1, 2023. Ontario released Regulation 559-22, Nalex own kits on December 12, 2022, which offers more details regarding the Nalex own kit requirement. Ontario released this webpage on December 13, 2022, which offers crucial direction on the Nalex own kit need. Sixth, British Columbia Court of Appeal disapproves of using precise legal tests to define employee status for Employment Standards Act purposes. In Beach Place Ventures Limited v Employment Standards Tribunal, 2022 BCCA 147, the British Columbia Court of Appeal affirmed a ruling by the Employment Standards Tribunal, which was supported by the Supreme Court of British Columbia, that three cab drivers were employees rather than independent contractors. The BCCA rejected the idea that employee status for the Employment Standards Act should be determined by a specific legal standard that is generally applied. The court determined that the key issue is whether the individual is rendering services as a person in business on his account, and that to make that determination, a non-exhaustive list of factors should be taken into account in a contextualized manner. These factors include, but are not limited to, whether the individual provides their equipment, whether they hire their helpers, the level of financial risk assumed by the individual, the degree of responsibility for investment, and more. Next, due to its ambiguity and broadness, the Ontario Court of Appeal finds that the Common Law Non-Competition Clause is unenforceable. The OCA dismissed an employer's appeal of an application judge's finding that a non-competition language in an employment agreement governed by common law was invalid because it was vague and overbroad in M and P Drug Mart Inc. v. Norton, 2022 ONCA 398. In cases where common law principles are in play, the ruling sheds light on the kind of examination a court in Ontario will conduct to assess enforceability. It implies that Ontario courts will rule that a non-competition clause is invalid if it is unreasonable between the parties, because it is vague or because the scope of the forbidden activities is too broad, even though an agreement is voluntarily agreed into. If such a condition expressly and solely prohibits the employee from performing a certain sort of job at a given place, it will be more likely to be viewed as fair and enforceable. Finally, a court will only consider the text of a non-competition clause when determining whether it is enforceable, rejecting an employer's attempts to persuade the court that certain events demonstrate the party's purpose was different from what the contract discloses. Next is, according to the Ontario Court of Appeal, if a union member files a claim against a third party and argues that it involves a matter that is not covered by a collective bargaining agreement, the court will have jurisdiction over the case rather than the arbitrator. In McCoy v. Hoy, 2022 ONCA 403, the O.C.A. dismissed an appeal of a motion judge's decision that permitted a Canadian Football League player to pursue a damages claim against a doctor for failing to properly diagnose his football injury in the Superior Court. The O.C.A. concurred with the motion judge that the medical malpractice issue was beyond the purview of the collective agreement, which only covered claims originating from employment with the C.F.L. club and not from third-party carelessness. 
According to McCoy v. Choi, unionized employers must be aware that if a union member files a claim against a third party and it is found that the essential nature of the claim pertains to a subject beyond the purview of the collective agreement. The third party is not a party to the collective agreement, and claims against third parties are not covered by the collective agreement. A court rather than an arbiter will have jurisdiction to rule on the claim. Moving on British Columbia's Labor Relations Code has been modified to enable automatic card check union certification in some situations. Bill 10 2022, Labor Relations Code Amendment Act, 2022 of British Columbia obtained royal assent and was signed into law on June 2, 2022. As a result, British Columbia became one of the few provinces in Canada to provide an automatic card check union certification procedure, whereby at least 55% of the workers in the proposed bargaining unit sign union membership cards OU may read a more thorough story here. Now, in light of proceedings under the Companies Creditors Arrangement Act, the Ontario Court of Appeal clarifies the issue of employment termination. GuestLogix Incorporated v Anchipalovskaya, 2022 ONCA 454, affirms that if 1. When an employer dismisses an employee during legal proceedings in which it is seeking Companies Creditors Arrangement Act C. CAA Creditor Protection. 2. A court orders the release of claims by the employer's creditors, including an employee whose employment has been terminated in the context of the proceedings because, at that point, they have become a former employee. This is done under a plan of compromise and arrangement, which is a proposal the company makes to its creditors on how it will handle the debts it owes as of the date of filing. 3. The years of employment will not be considered continuous to calculate common law fair notice if the employer promptly rehires the employee, and the employer fires the employee later without cause. This strategy gives effect to the court order releasing all creditors from any claims CCAA release however. Employers should be aware that the non-exhaustive list of considerations in Bardal for the computation of common law notice will be taken into account when a court analyzes the termination of employment in the context of CCAA proceedings and a CCAA release. A court can come to the conclusion that the employee is entitled to a longer notice period than they would have received had they begun working when they were rehired since the employer would profit from their prior employment. Now, let us move on next, the termination clause in the employer's standard employment contracts is unclear, according to the Alberta Court of Appeal. The Court of Queen's Bench of Alberta dismissed Bryant v. Parkland School Division, 2021 ABQB 391, but the Court of Appeal for Alberta permitted an appeal in Bryant v. Parkland School Division, 2022 ABCA 220. The termination language in the standard form employment contracts, which said that they were entitled to 60, 60 days or more written notice, was not unclear, according to the ABQB, which dismissed a challenge by three workers for common law reasonable notice. The ABCA disagreed, and if the parties could not agree, it was sent back to the ABQB to determine what constitutes common law fair notice. Another reason why employers who intend to include termination clauses in their employment contracts should think about using language that unmistakably restricts or eliminates the right to common law reasonable notice, while also preserving all statutory minimum entitlements is the ABCA's decision in Parkland. Moving on next, the Superior Court of Justice of Ontario rules that sexual harassment is not a separate tort that can give rise to a separate cause of action and that an employer cannot be held vicariously liable for the conduct of one employee against another. Sexual harassment is not a separate tort in Ontario that can support a separate cause of action, according to the court's ruling in Incognito v Sky Service Business Aviation Inc., 2022 ONSC 1795 Additionally, an employer cannot be held vicariously liable for the sexual harassment of one of its employees by another. However, as we learned from the case of A, B, V, C, D, 2022 B, H, R, T, 0, 8, 90, if management staff members fail to take appropriate action to stop discriminatory harassment in the workplace once they are aware of the offending conduct, they are creating a toxic work environment, and they may be held personally liable for violating an employee's right to a workplace free from sex discrimination under Section 5. One of Ontario's human rights code for this infraction, the employer can be held vicariously accountable. Employers may also be held accountable for specific acts of harassment committed by their employees if they are the employer's guiding thought. 
Next is, according to the Alberta Court of Appeal, expressing an employee's refusal to accept an employer's unilateral reduction in compensation as soon as possible will prevent the claim for constructive dismissal from failing. The case is Kostekic v Paramount Resources Limited according to ABCA 230, a ruling of the ABCA. A worker who refuses to accept a unilateral cut in pay should do so as soon as possible since failing to do so might fail a constructive dismissal claim. According to the ruling, an employee may be assumed to have accepted a pay reduction if they continue to execute their job tasks for at least three to four weeks, without objecting. The British Columbia Human Rights Tribunal determined that the employer constructively terminated an employee in Laflesh v NL, FD Auto. 2022 B CHR T88 When it unilaterally removed the employee from the management position, she had previous to her absence, transferred it to her replacement, and failed to communicate with the employee regarding her return to work this case dealt with constructive dismissal in part. Next is. All termination provisions in an employment agreement are deemed invalid by Ontario Superior Court of Justice because the actual termination clause complied with the Employment Standards Act of 2000, but the confidentiality and conflict of interest clauses did not. The court illustrated the broad applicability of the Waxdale v. Swegan North America Inc. 2020 ON CA 391 concept for deciding whether a termination clause in an employment agreement is valid in Henderson v. Slavin. 2022 ONSC 2964. The Employment Standards Act, 2000, requirements must be taken into account when analyzing the agreement as a whole rather than piecemeal, and if any termination provision violates the ESA, all termination provisions in the contract will be deemed unenforceable, regardless of the existence of a severability clause, which cannot be used to separate the offending portion of the termination provisions. The court determined that the secrecy and conflict of interest terms were unlawful because they did not adhere to the ESA, even though the actual termination clause complies with the ESA. As a result, the employment agreement's termination clauses were entirely void, and the employee had been fired improperly. According to Henderson v. Slavin, courts will evaluate all clauses in any agreement or policy that state that an employee's failure to comply with any of the requirements would be a reason for termination without pay. Instead of focusing just on whether a specific termination clause is invalid a termination provision that would otherwise be enforceable may be declared unenforceable by a court if it finds that any such provision violates the ESA. Next, the discretionary nature of the bonus provision in the employment agreement, according to the Ontario Court of Appeal, does not mean that the employer is completely free to exercise discretion. In Bowen v. J. C. Clark Limited, 2022 ONCA 614, the OCA warned employers that just because a bonus clause is discretionary in an employment agreement doesn't imply the employer is completely free to use that discretion however they see fit. Employers are advised against adopting a purely subjective or unconstrained stance since doing so would conflict with their duty to use their judgment fairly and reasonably. The OCA urges employers to take into account both individual employee performance and whether discretionary incentives will be given to similarly situated workers when determining eligibility for a discretionary bonus in a given year and its quantity. Number 17, employers will be prohibited from conspiring, agreeing to, or arranging to enter into wage-fixing agreements and no-poach agreements with another unaffiliated employer under an amendment to Canada's Competition Act that will take effect on June 23, 2023. Canada's Budget Implementation Act, 2022, No. 1, Bill C-19, which revised the Competition Act which applies to all federally and provincially regulated enterprises operating in Canada, was given royal assent on June 23, 2022. These changes include the addition of a new Section 45, 1.1 that, starting on June 23, 2023, would prevent businesses from coordinating with another company with whom they are not linked to engaging in wage-fixing arrangements and no-poach agreements. Number 18, Unprecedented Bill 28, the Keeping Students in Class Act, 2022, was introduced in Ontario and then repealed. Ontario filed Bill 28, Keeping Students in Class Act, 2022 in an unprecedented attempt to stop school board employees represented by the Canadian Union of Public Employees from going forward with a strike scheduled for early November 2022, Bill 28. 
all companies that had unionized workplaces were interested in Bill 28 because of its novel characteristics. Bill 28, among other things, imposed collective agreements without allowing the parties to negotiate them, for bad strikes and lockouts in advance. Fined people heavily for doing so, shielded itself from legal challenge by referencing the notwithstanding clause of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, declared that it applied despite Ontario's Human Rights Code, and offered strong protection to workers. Bill 28 got royal assent on November 3, 2022, while Ontario's Keeping Students in Class Repeal Act, 2022, which was tabled and approved on November 14, 2022 was believed to have taken effect on November 3, 2022. Bill 35 annulled Bill 28, declared it to have never been in effect, and declared the CAS that Bill 28 had declared to be in operation to have never started. Number 19. The Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario determined that it has concurrent jurisdiction over human rights issues in unionized workplaces under the Human Rights Code. In Vilgosh v. London District Catholic School Board, 2022 HRTO 1194, the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario, Tribunal found, that the Human Rights Code of the province gives it concurrent jurisdiction over human rights concerns that occur in a unionized workplace meaning that unionized employees may choose to pursue human rights claims through arbitration or the tribunal. Accordingly, Little has changed in Ontario notwithstanding the Supreme Court of Canada's ruling in Northern Regional Health Authority v. Horrocks, 2021 SCC 42, in which the SCC determined that in Manitoba, human rights issues originating from the interpretation application or alleged breach of a collective agreement fell under the exclusive jurisdiction of a labour arbitrator, and the Manitoba Human Rights Commission lacks concurrent authority to address such matters. Number 20. Principles regarding wrongfully terminated employees' duty to take reasonable actions to minimize damages clarified by Ontario Court of Appeal. The Ontario Court of Appeal's ruling in Lake v. La Press, 2022 ONCA 742, defines concepts about a wrongfully discharged employee's need to take reasonable measures to reduce their losses, such that the person must not unduly delay the commencement of their job search. The individual must only look for similar employment, i.e., status, hours, and pay, and if the employee applies for a position with a title more senior than their current one. The new paid medical leave provisions and supporting regulations of the Canada Labour Code become effective, the new paid medical leave provisions of the Canada Labour Code, and the regulations supporting its implementation become effective on December 1, 2022. Employees in federally regulated companies are now entitled to a maximum of 10 days of paid medical leave per calendar year, under the new requirements. The exact number of days that an employee receives will vary depending on how long they have worked continuously the labor program, produced two interpretations, policies, and guidelines to offer advice on this new entitlement. Number 22, the Ontario Court of Appeal makes it clear that when reviewing the reasonableness of administrative decisions, courts must use the Vavilov principles, including decisions of the Ontario Labour Relations Board. In the connected cases Turkiewicz, Tomasz Turkiewicz Custom Masonry Homes v Bricklayers, Masons Independent Union of Canada, Local 1, 2022 ONCA 780 and Enercare Home and Commercial Services Limited Partnership v Unifor Local 975, 2022 ONCA 779. The OCA reviewed whether the Divisional Court used the proper standard of review required by Canada, Minister of Citizenship and Immigration v Vavilov, 2019 SCC 65. The Ontario Court of Appeal made it abundantly clear in both decisions that courts must adhere to the Vavilov principles when conducting reasonableness reviews of administrative decisions, including those of the Ontario Labour Relations Board. These principles call for judicial restraint and respect for the unique role and specialized knowledge of the administrative decision maker, and allow courts to intervene only if it is truly necessary to protect the legality, reason, and fairness of the decision. A reviewing court should refrain from making its own decisions on the problems, i.e., it shouldn't inquire what choice it would have taken if it had been the administrative decision maker, try to discover the range of potential outcomes, perform a de novo examination, or try to find the best answer. A reviewing court should simply evaluate whether the administrative decision-maker's actual judgment, including its justification and result, was unreasonable. 
Occupational insurance maximum unpaid medical leave for federally regulated private sector employees increased to 27 weeks and sickness benefits extended to 26 weeks. Canada stated that the duration of employment insurance illness benefits would be permanently increased from 15 to 26 weeks beginning on December 18, 2022. Additionally, to be consistent with this change, the maximum amount of unpaid medical leave allowed to federally regulated private sector employees was extended under the Canada Labour Code on the same date from 17 to 27 weeks. Number 24. Canada Emergency Response Benefit Payments Should Not Be Subtracted From Damage Awards For Wrongful Termination, The British Columbia Court of Appeal Ruled. In Yates v Langley Motorsports Centre Limited, 2022 BCCA 398, the Court of Appeal for British Columbia determined that Canada Emergency Response Benefit Payments should not be subtracted from damage awards for wrongful dismissal. This decision helped to alleviate the uncertainty caused by inconsistent lower court rulings the first appellate court ruling to address. This question is Yates. And the last one, the Protecting a Sustainable Public Sector for Future Generations Act, Bill 124, was ruled to be invalid and of no effect by Ontario Superior Court of Justice, although the province filed a notice of appeal. The Ontario Superior Court of Justice pronounced Bill 124, the Protecting a Sustainable Public Sector for Future Generations Act, Bill 124, to be null and invalid and of no force or effect in the case of Ontario English Catholic Teachers Associates v His Majesty, 2022, ONSC 6658. For a three-year moderation phase, Bill 124 restricted salary growth for around 780,000 workers in the larger public sector to 1% annually. Labor organizations challenged the constitutionality of the Act in 10 separate applications. The court found that the Act I infringed on the applicant's right to freedom of association under S2, D of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Charter. 2 did not violate the applicant's freedom of speech or equality rights under the Charter, and 3 was not saved by S1 of the Charter. As requested by the parties, the court postponed consideration of any remedy until after pronouncing the act to be null and invalid and having no force or effect. The numerous employees in the larger public sector that fall under the act's purview are not yet covered by it, but the Ontario government announced its intention to appeal after learning of the court's ruling the notice of appeal from the government, was submitted on December 29, 2022. That is all for today, in this video. What are your thoughts on this? Please let us know in the comments section below. Thanks for watching the entire video. Hopefully, the information is useful to you. See you later, in the next episode. Till then, take care.